welcome to the Truth Lover video podcast presented by Love and Truth Party. I am your host, Will Pye, author, speaker, transformational coach, retreat leader, and founder of Love and Truth Party. Love and Truth Party is a self-organizing, self-replicating community and movement of love and awakening, a wisdom school facilitating health, healing, and happiness, liberating humanity from the matrix of fear and self-loathing. Find us and join our mailing list at www.loveandtruthparty.com. Dot .org. We exist to empower the deep realization and integration of unity of consciousness of one human being and to inspire action in the world from this clarity as New Earth Ninjas, our playful avatar. We do so in the spirit of play, holding the paradox that all is well, even and including all collective crises, while simultaneously being moved to act to lessen suffering and serve the creation of conscious culture and society. Our projects include distributing a million love letters from the universe, inviting people to receive the love and care in these, and within the happiness acts, including the seven questions and other free resources at loveandtruthparty.org. Really thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Margaret Ross. Marg is the senior clinical psychologist at St. Vincent's Hospital here in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, happens to be somewhere that I worked and have had medical care, so I'm a big fan of St. Vincent's. And um, Marg is leading that uh, current trial, which is Australia's first into psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for cancer patients with death anxiety. And so there's a particular focus in your work, I understand, around palliative care and the psychosocial aspects of, of cancer treatment. Wonderful to have you on the show today, Mark. Thank you for Hello. taking the time Thank to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you again. Um, yes, I'm, and actually, we're also we're also working with people who have non-malignant diseases, so people who are terminally ill who may have anxiety or or are depressed about having you know the, the terminal nature of their illness. So, mm. um, yeah, so cancer, is, but also non-cancer patients are are welcome into the, to the study as well. So. Yeah, so would that so, would that be neurological um, diseases or I guess there's a um, wide range so of so more more things like that you know it's like end stage lung can uh, or lung uh, diseases um, end stage renal failure so kidney uh -huh. um, liver that kind of thing um, depending on I guess where people are at in terms of their diagnosis and and, and their disease motor neuron disease you know, so, so those kind of so the, yeah they may not be uh, cancer. Um, in terms of the, the life limiting illness, but um, um, yeah, for the most part, though, we would probably see more cancer patients largely anyway. So, yeah. Now, many of our listeners and viewers might be aware that we're in a, a sort of renaissance of psychotherapeutic applications of psychedelic substances. Um, many might not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd love you to perhaps give a little bit of an outline of why are we doing this trial? Um, mm -hmm. what, what would be the, the reason or the data to think that taking psilocybin, the active ingredient of uh, the colloquially known magic mushrooms, would be <laughs> helpful for people um, with, with death anxiety or, or, or with depression? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, to, to give it some context, and I mean, we could go back many hundreds <laughs> thousands of years in terms of its indigenous use, it has a very rich history um, uh, in various indigenous societies in terms of its sacramental uh, use and healing use. Um, so we've known for a long time that it, that it has uh, therapeutic uh, type qualities and certainly some research that sort of started around, you know, maybe the, the 50s and the 60s with classic psychedelics like LSD and uh, which is chemically quite similar to psilocybin. Um, and then psilocybin itself, you know, we started actually understanding that it was for some reason helping people who, um, who had quite significant and, and quite paralyzing death anxiety. And it was found out quite by accident. There was an, a, an anesthetist from Chicago called um, Eric Kast, who was looking uh, to, to research um, a, um, a, a, a pain uh, like an analgesia and was looking at LSD as being a potential compound that could help um, his cancer patients who had, you know, quite intractable cancer pain. 
uh, this is sort of back in the 60s. And he, so he used LSD and uh, was, you know, seeing if, if he could get some um, uh, pain reduction properties in, in the, the treatment outcomes. And while that certainly happened, what he did find was that all of a sudden people had these really profound, you know, reporting really profound experiences um, uh, whereby they, their, their preoccupation, and I think that the, that really arresting fear that they had around dying and the, the, the dying process and progression mm. of their illness had really abated quite significantly and very rapidly. Mm. Uh, so this kind of um, spun him off in a slightly different direction. And, curious and, uh, side effect. And, yes, a very curious side effect. Um, so, but, but quite a profound one as well. Mm. Um, and then, so, you know, and LSD again, you know, quite chemically similar to psilocybin and, um, you know, things then, then moved, uh, I think, so they were doing it at Maryland and so forth. And then um, Stan Goff, who you may have heard of, who ended up doing some work in holotropic breath work, uh, he was also looking at this when the Controlled Substances Act uh, pretty much shut down the, the research for, for the next uh, couple of decades at least. Um, but by that stage, they gathered quite a bit of data to suggest that it was uh, not only helpful for, for death anxiety, but also um, um, addiction as well. So there's, there were a number of, of uh, indicators that, that told us that there was some therapeutic benefit here. And unfortunately, because it was such a politicised, uh, you know, all the, the classic psychedelics became very politicised compounds because it got caught up with the counterculture movement of the 60s and, you know, and the 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 anti-war and the the, the left and, and the, that kind of thing. So, so this really swift political backlash ensued, which which saw it all kind of shut down. Um, and then I think sort of in the nineties, Rick Strassman uh, was able to do some um, research using DMT, dimethyltryptamine, another classic psychedelic um, found in um, ayahuasca. Uh, but was this was obviously conducted in in a um, a medical setting and, and so forth. So that kind of began um, the, the the research renaissance, if you like, which is the way it's sort of been described. And then I think in 2000, um, but in particularly in my area, uh, Charlie Grob um, in UCLA, they started looking at you know, just looking at open label trials of psilocybin um, with cancer patients, and uh, you know had pretty stunning results, even with quite you know low dose at that stage. Though they had to go in quite um, Gingerly, I think, because obviously the, the FDA <laughs> had to approve these, these these research protocols. But uh, how low how low know, was even, the dose in these initial studies? Ah, uh, so uh, look, uh, these are synthetic versions of psilocybin. right. So the so grammage might not, be a little bit yeah. Not, yeah, not not comparable, I guess. To, to, but it was sort of lower. Like I, I think he was using um, two milligrams. Um, so uh, 20 milligrams, which is our, and we're using 25 milligrams. And even though that doesn't sound like a, a huge jump, it does make quite quite a significant difference. Um, so yeah, and then that was sort of followed up with some work at John Hopkins and um, NYU by Roland Griffiths, who everyone's pretty familiar with now if you've been looking into any kind of psychedelic research. Um, and they did some bigger studies, phase two, looking at um, cancer patients' experience of depression and anxiety and found very rapid um, and dramatic improvements that were sustained um, even after six months of, of no treatment. So that was quite and, and those, remarkable. Those were, I mean, just to say, Ronan Griffiths, most many people would have heard through Michael Pollan's recent book. I think that's obviously really opened up a lot of this um, data and information to, to a broader public conversation, which is great. And some of those words that you're using, I, I just want to, I think, that emphasize um, dr dramatic, rapid, sustained, mm. lasting. Um, yes. all, all of these things are very unusual in therapeutic yeah. treatments of addiction, depression, death, anxiety, right? This, this is not mm. common. It's not like we have all these other treatments that are working and oh, these are kind of working too. It's like, wow, these things potentially are doing something rapidly with a sustained effect that is 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 very exciting uh, from a from a research absolutely. perspective. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely, and the 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 words that we, you know, I guess in psychiatry, we loathe to to use 
and we don't use them lightly either. You know, you, and Ben Sessa talks about this, but we don't use the word cure in psychiatry. We just don't. Um, and we do have, you know, we've got, there's talking therapies. There's a lot of modalities that can really work very well for people. There are medications that, you know, and they, they again, they have their place, but they certainly have their, their limits. Um, and they don't work for everybody. Um, this represents a, a really very exciting and very new paradigm to psychiatry, I think. Um, and, you know, I think when you, when you undertake a, a, a psychedelic experience and in this setting, it almost always fairly reliably invokes a period of, of and quite profound self-reflective um, time that you can work with therapeutically. And uh, um, on, on top of all the, the, the good stuff that it does, because they happen to be, it's an indole alkaloid tryptamine, which means that it's, it's serotonergic. So it works on our 5-HT2A receptors, which is serotonergic um, receptors so we, we do kind of get this massive hit of kind of the, the, the serotonin um but then also uh as, aside from all those mechanisms that can kind of help us with the, the, the depression the anxiety from a pharmacokinetic point of view it can really occasion quite uh profound um and mystical experiences this is quite commonly reported with uh, people who've gone through these studies um, and which is why it was of such interest to me, working with people who are at the end of their life. Um, we know that 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 uh, you know having sort of a positive, the spiritual well-being is is a big um, buffer for people in terms of experiencing distress at end of life. Um, and um, and I think the there's there's I mean, aside from the fact that it could quite rapidly and, and, and dramatically uh, reduce symptoms of, of suffering um, that, that we, we, we see so often, it does something else. There's something that it can act, it can really kind of, it appears to be able to access people's existential um, anxiety, sense of connectedness to the, to the universe, to the greater world um, and to each other, to themselves, I think as well. It, it, it can just um, access people in a way that I have not ever seen really, you know, outside of fairly um, uh, quite intense spiritual practices such as, you know, meditations and yeah. uh, or perhaps breath work and, and, and so forth. So, um, and to do so in, in uh, a setting whereby it could, could happen quite quickly really um, because understand as well people that I'm working with we don't have time there's sometimes we just don't have that you know two years of you know okay it's psychotherapy and, and working towards this and so forth you know once a week uh, there's there's not that time we're, we're, there's there's precious time that is left um and watching people have that precious time you know withdrawn or or, or you know um anguished and and terrified was the thing that really prompted me to, to seek this out in the first place and, and bring it to us. Yeah, so, so that's I, where, where psychedelics speak to me. <laughs> I, I really just want to honor and acknowledge the profundity of the mission and the depth of purpose that, that you're, that you're undertaking. Um, you know, from my own experience, most of my listeners and viewers won't be surprised to know that I've worked with um, most uh, entheogenic medicines, um, both as a, initially as a uh, someone who was curious as to the nature of consciousness and what this neurology is capable of and so on um and then latterly after a diagnosis of brain cancer um to explore potential healing with with various medicines and and for, for me at university i think the greatest thing i learned at university was via a, a high dose psilocybin um experience I, I think that was far more valuable than anything i picked up in a sociology or philosophy <laughs> um lecture and that 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 depth of subjective interpretation of such an experience is actually quite common i understand on the research one of the most common things that people say is that their experience with this with this with this molecule with this psilocybin was the most meaningful or the most profound experience of their entire life I was just chatting with a friend just a few days ago. He's, he's a very successful guy. He's got five beautiful children. He's married his sweetheart from 
school for the last 30 years. He's had a lot of business success. He's traveled a lot. So he's had a lot of profound and meaningful experiences. And he said his psilocybin uh, high dose experience was the most profound and meaningful um, experience of, of his entire life. So I understand that's, that's quite common in the research. Mm. People will, will often say that this was, mm. and, and ministers will say this was the most religious experience of their entire life, that this was the most divine experience mm. of their entire life, which is, um, it's a bit of a, a euphemism mm. or a downplay, it's a, a curious side effect. Um, <laughs> it is, I think, yeah, and um, Roland, uh, Grace, I mean, one of his, his question is actually, you know, how would you rate this? And anyone, people were, were rating it up amongst the top five most meaningful experiences of their life. You know, up there with having a child and or or, or you know, getting married or, or, or some something kind of really really powerful personally. But um, and we hear this so frequently that it's not just a, an outlier experience for people. It's happening more and more and more. Um, and I know. In, 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 if, if, I'm sorry if, I, if, if you've ever heard me speak you've probably heard me say this before but I, I often say that people have this existential angst we all kind of carry an ache an existential ache um, within us um, to, and you know we're more keenly aware of it or we square with it to some degree depending on, on how we you know roll with life how we feel about mortality and so forth but there's, there's something about that that, that psychedelics can really access um and it's something that we're we're kind of i and i think talking talking with people about since the trial was announced and, and the the i guess very unexpected not unwelcome at all very positive and you know overwhelming um public support that we've had since the trial was announced that's great to hear um yeah it, it, it's it was something we weren't expecting to be honest we were expecting much more pushback but it was just overwhelming and the curiosity and the the um you know, people that they're starving for something. There's something that mm. we're we just um, we just don't we're disconnected from, or we're we're not connected to. And perhaps psychedelics, you know, act as a bridge to that aspect of ourselves. That that reconnecting. Um, I'm 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 still, you know, I talk about this as though it's something that I still don't understand, and I don't. That's the that's the beauty of it in a way. I'm researching something that is. Um, yes, I understand it from the research and the scientific point of view from what we know about it, but it's still such a profound mystery, mm. even for those of us who are researching this. And and, um, and we're getting to know the neurobiological correlates of, of, of um, psilocybin and some various states of consciousness and mind. And, um, and you know, we, we know about the default mode network and how it can downregulate that, um, which is that region of brain circuitry, which is, most active when we're at rest and thinking about ourselves in the past and the future and it can become quite negativistic and rigid um, in when we're depressed or when we're anxious so it has a way of relaxing that and expanding perspective we know it can do all these things which is fascinating and, and pretty amazing in and of itself but there's just aspects of this that is um, that we still don't fully understand and it's such a, a, a visceral and embodied experience um, uh, for for people, so I, I think um, there's so much more to know about this as well. well it it um, seems and like that's it, part of it. The the, uh, <laughs> the joy of it. Yeah, right. I can I can imagine it's uh, an incredibly joyful, meaningful work to be involved in, to, in a, in a broader mm -hmm. sense, but also to, to to be working therapeutically with people and to to witness the the shifts that occur. It strikes mm -hmm. me that. This this research is is striking at the very heart of some of our most fundamental questions, or some might say misunderstandings about the nature of reality, such as materialism or uh, what the nature mm. of consciousness is. You know, this idea that consciousness is a epiphenomenon of brain activity, which I, I think is is, is ludicrous. Um, I'm mm. much more inclined towards the view that consciousness is primary, and that uh, the brain is a an antennae or a receiver for consciousness and what appears to happen as i understand it from fmris and so on with uh, some of the research that the brain's um in, the, the brain's interaction with itself the brain's activity the brain's holistic firing seems to be fundamentally 
changed. All sorts of different connections are observed, and uh, you know, they, they put mm -hmm. colours on it, and it looks looks very beautiful. And yes, it looks <laughs> quite psychedelic. Right, <laughs> funnily enough. It does, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but then you have this question: like, why does that? lead to feelings of um, oneness or feelings of love you talked about that desire for mm. connection like we all mm. um, want connection we all want love we all want the love of our parents we all want the love of of, mm. of of life and we perhaps unskillfully go around the world through our lives trying to find love through um, you know alcohol or through sex or through uh, work or through money or through status all these sorts of things and and yet mm -hmm. the, the experience with these medicines and I, I i really like that word medicines rather than drugs pointing mm -hmm. to their therapeutic benefit it, it it gives this this direct embodied experience as you say of 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 love or e even we might start to use um the the g word an experience of god an experience of the divine I know that DMT is talked about as the God molecule. That you know, perhaps this is the God the, molecule. Yes, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and and psilocybin. I, you know, I again, that's what people so often report. Friends, they say to me, you know, it was an experience of of love and awe, an experience of of connectedness, and it seems that that as a as a as a biochemical experience, you know, there are biochemical correlates, gives something. In, in meaning that is um, profound and, and almost hard to put into words or almost uh, yeah. you know, to put it into language is to um, mm -hmm. con contain it in a way that the experience itself is uh, un un uncontainable. Mm, absolutely. And people often report that they, they don't have the words for, for oh. their experience. In fact, one of the things that we do when we're in the, the dose session is we have um, art supplies for people because sometimes it's so profound, it's so um, incredible, but they don't have words. Words can't scaffold that experience. Or, or, or you know, I heard Rick Dolan call it, you're trying to put a linguistic wrapper around the experience, it just doesn't cut it. Um, you know, so, and indeed, some of the, the, the integration experiences where we sort of try and cue a memory of, of what they've been through. Um, and, and bring it into waking life because that's really the, the point of the psychedelic experience is how can we sort of bring that, that forward and how we, can we you know, move that into our daily life so that it can then sort of have lasting changes on our, you know, our mood and our thinking and our behavior and all that kind of thing. But, but, um, but things like you know, embodied experiences, it could be art, it could be you know, yoga, some kind of meditative practice, um, music, a way of having a felt sense of being um, is, is very, very important. Um, thinking tends to intellectualize it a little bit. And I, I understand we, we do need a bit of a narrative. We're meaning making creatures. We, we, we want a bit of a, a narrative to make sense of what we've been through, but that's only part of what, what, what's going on here. We actually want to embody that and bring it back into your body. And because um, we're so disconnected from our bodies, <laughs> so we sort of live in our heads a lot of the time and, and, and slightly less as we can Robinson would say, but, but, um, so yeah, there's where I think you know we we are starving for these really profound moments, and you're right. We we may find them in the bottle, or we we find it in sex, or whatever. But it's it's momentary, hedonistic kind of pleasure seeking. You know, there's something about this that is just um, you know the the depth. Um, you know, it really cultivates a, a deeper um, connection to. Um, each other, ourselves, um, and certainly in the instances of you know the people that we're working with in relation to their illness, it's cultivating a, a different awareness and a different relationship to the, their illness, the idea of dying, um, but also to the natural world. Um, some really fascinating research now moving into the space of how psychedelics change our relationship to the natural world. Um, and I think doing a little bit of work at Imperial College or, or have done. Um, I met with um, uh, a, a guy, a wonderful guy by the name of Sam Gandhi, who was um, doing some work. Um, uh, I think he was initially with, sort of the, with the Beckley, but now he's also doing a little bit of work, I think, in um, IC. But 
talking about, you know, and he's an ecologist and, and talking about how, you I, know. I see that with the intensive make, care. Or? Oh, sorry, um, Imperial College. Oh, got it. <laughs> I'm back in, in holiday brain. Um, <laughs> so and so they're the group who, you know, Robin Carhart Harris and David Knox and, and, um, and so forth who did the depression studies that have now just taken off and, you know, they're getting incredible results, you know, overseas and they've just published um, recently as well um, at Johns Hopkins about their research there. But, um, yeah, just going back to, to Sam's um, interest in the, the how psychedelics may actually help us protect uh, the natural world um, because of our deepened relationship to it and respect of it. Um, so that's a really um, fascinating area of research that, that psychedelics is looking into. Um, as well, so it's it has such far-reaching um, kind of implications here. So, um, and I guess for us, obviously, when when you you're told that you you have a terminal illness and time is short, um, our you know our job, obviously, when, when we're working with our patients, is okay. How can we how can we help you um, make use of your time in a way that that is well, not only making use of it, I don't like that that word in, in that way, but but um, how can we make it as meaningful for you as possible? If there is suffering, how can we go about reducing that suffering so that you can be fully present? You can have those really important conversations with loved ones. You can feel and experience joy of sunshine on your face and or on your back or sand between your toes. Um, or water rushing over your hands and fingers and, and uh, the ocean or, or, or and, and really taking in those experiences rather than feeling so gripped and hijacked by this rumoured fear of, you know, is this the last time I'm going to be with my family? Is this the last time I'm going to be, you know, oh my gosh, oh gosh, how's it going to happen? And then all of a sudden, within nanoseconds, they're in this spiral of, of thought that has completely ripped them out of the present moment. So they're not enjoying this precious time that they have because they're anguished and um, and and frightened. Mm. So yeah, and we think that that you know, and we know we know that that um, certainly the the outcomes of the psychedelic research that we've seen certainly helps with those the, the symptoms that you know in terms of the depression, the anxiety, but also reconnects you to that present moment experience in that mm. way. Um, so that's that's what we're really hoping for in our work with with our our beautiful patients that convince them. There's a beautiful narrative there that um, uh, Paul Stamets, one of the sort of uh, high priests or gurus of, of, of mushrooms in general, <laughs> not just um, those that contain yeah. psilocybin, um, he talks about how he believes that the mushrooms are essentially using him as a host to serve nature, to that, that Mm. And, and this this is it makes kind of sense that most of these obviously the LSD is or, originally um, a, a, a natural biological occurrence. It, it's a, a, a fungi mm -hmm. ultimately. The yeah. pre synthesization it's got fungus, yes. <laughs> right. So mm. all, all of these things are naturally occurring within Mother Earth, within Gaia, and clearly the the human species is um, got rather disconnected from its from its own body very often and yeah. from the the physical mm -hmm. earth and the these substances it's interesting to hear the research sort of supporting this this slightly poetic narrative do seem to be um that their purpose their function seems to be um reordering the biological operating system of the human species such that we will have a better insight and relationship and understanding of how we interact with the world around us with our with our environment um, which would be quite helpful, I think, at, at this time um, mm -hmm. in 2020 <laughs> upon planet yeah. Earth, if we developed a richer yeah. sense of our interaction with mm -hmm. the planet. Yeah, and it offers us that opportunity to do exactly that. So, you know, and and gosh, you know, do we need it more than ever? Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a shame in a way because of the, the you know, that it was so shut down for two decades, three and nearly four in our case here. Um, but, you know, and we're, we're sort of gaining momentum now, but but you sort of think about where we could have been if, if we'd had all that time to, to research. But in saying that, we've now got really, you know, more rigorous sort of research 
kind of standards we can do a bit of research we've now got you know very good science telling us what's going on in the brain when this, this happens and um but but, the, but beyond that beyond science and beyond you know there's something um very powerful that that happens for for some for some people when they they have this psychedelic experience that words can't capture and i you know and even some ways science will will always have difficulty capturing um and um but the the profundity of of what they experience is is um uh when you witness that i think it's, it's certainly the, the reason i describe my work is privileged i have to say right yeah i, I feel that right. yeah the, the the tragedy of the you know to, to really make it explicitly clear all, all of the data that we have now not all of it certainly not but what what the data is pointing to we we had um 60 years ago and reading Stan Groff's biography, he's a, a, obviously a great writer and a, a hero of mine and many. And to try, I was trying to imagine what it would be like in, in the mid 50s, whenever it was to be, to be in this incredible space where you're providing a, a therapeutic effect that nothing else you've been able to provide for people has, has, has worked in this way. And, and then to have this um, you know, political, uh, unscientific legislative process prevent that work mm -hmm. from happening readily and and, and uh in, in in the public eye um mm -hmm. yeah that's I, I just that would be a, a tremendous personal challenge and, and hardship to to be and, and frustration and anger I, I would i would imagine but uh mm -hmm. and all credit to to stan and, and christina for creating holotropic breathwork and other ways to mm -hmm. support people in their um in their therapeutic growth it's, it's true also, yeah. of course, that much of the exploration and experimentation uh, has continued uh, throughout the times of prohibition. Mm. Um, governments have yeah. never successfully prohibited anything, and they never will. Um, no. thank, 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 thank God when it comes <laughs> to these sorts of medicines that have such value for society. Mm. And I know there are therapists, and, and you know, they publish their book when after they've died of how they've been doing this for 30 years providing um mm -hmm. mdma assisted therapy and so on so it, it it's mm -hmm. it's that's that's beautiful to know in some senses that there has been a continuation Absolutely. of the therapeutic applications of the best practices and so on so we have continued to evolve yeah. in spite of our um, lawmakers um confusion mm -hmm. or, <laughs> or or short-sightedness and I'm clearly sorry. The potential now is 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 vastly different. With without those limitations, mm -hmm. without those um, obstructions, and I'm interested. Mm -hmm. What what do you see? What do you see as the great potential? As the great opportunity? Let's say, you know, as years pass, we do more of these trials, we do more of these studies. What's what's the big game mm -hmm. for society for the people in general? I think, um, you know, you know it's, it's something that, that I'm actually discussing with a number of colleagues at the moment. We're, we're maybe putting a paper together about this. So hopefully um, I can give you a concise answer because I'm still percolating on, on what that would look like. What I personally would hope to see is that, that we have a, um, we develop a, a, I guess a solid respect and reverence for, for these medicines, actually, that, that have already kind of been, um understood and and held reverently in indigenous society largely i mean there's also the there was the stories of, of i think it might have been you know, Aztec where they were taking like a and then going out and doing human sacrifices and things like that so it can go the other way as well we have to be really mindful here and what we're bringing into to the this the you know the the general population in that way we need to do this very sensitively and with, with lots of good discussion and good good education and um I, I think though if we do this well if we do it right in um that way we have a, a real opportunity to offer um a, a whole other way of healing our existential um world i think for me um I don't know how 
other researchers feel about this. I may be sort of on my, on my own in this regard. And, and obviously I work in, in an area of research that's in, in medicine and in psychiatry in, and the interface between the two. And at the moment, a lot of the research is really looking at areas of disorder, if you like. Mm. So there's, um, you know, depression, there's anxiety, there's addiction, um, <clears throat> where things are oh, we're not going so well from a psychiatric kind of point of view. I would like to see psychedelic medicine used for wellness, actually. Um, not just disorder. I think there's, there's a scope for that. Down the track, I still think we're, we're pretty green at, at understanding this here. And I, I think um, uh, there was something about the way that, that, that um, psychedelic plants and, and plant medicine were understood and, and held quite um, reverently, I think, in that way, but also respectfully in, in those cultures, but, but because they, they really understood what inappropriate use looked mm. like as well. And there was a respect for that. I think what, what happens sometimes in the West and our dominant tendency is to find the quick fix and do it now mm. and see what sort of come, tends to come from that is that we hear these great stories, we read Michael Pond's book, I want some of that, I want some of that. And then, you know, we sort of without reading the fine print, perhaps the general population can just sort of jump into something w without, you know, um, really it, it could look, look quite indiscriminate use. And you, when you get that kind of indiscriminate, unprepared, you know, unintentional and not so safe kind of use, you can get quite nasty experiences as, as psychedelics. So I think that we still have a lot of work to do in terms of being able to understand the, the uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like that was a serious business, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, um, uh, it can be profound, but it's, um, you know, what, what, what did Ben Sessa say? You can soar angelic or fly kind of into, into those sort of realms of, of, of hell. And if you're not prepared for that, some people can find that that it can be, and arguably probably more therapeutically, um, uh, valuable in some of those really challenging kind of moments. But if you're not prepared for that, it can really freak people out and um, re-traumatize people. So I think we've got a bit of work to do before we get there. I'm not worried about the psychedelic community at all. They get it. <laughs> they, they understand um, uh, these the substances. They hold the space uh, while, uh, you know, I've spoken to many, many people to sort of give it a broad brush but for the many that I've spoken to, they, they understand um, the, um, and, and respect the, the plant medicine. They go into it with, you know, intention um, and uh, prepared and, and um, you know, making sure that, that they're, they're using this in a respectful kind of a way. You often talk to, to people and they'll talk about, you know, respecting the plant, respecting the medicine and, um, um, and being almost reverential of it in, in some, some ways. But, but then when, I think when they orient themselves to, to the medicine in that way, I think that they're much more likely to have a, um, a, a positive and enriching experience of it. So, so that was my very long-winded way of saying, I do hope it will, will re-enter the public um, mm. uh, in that way. The fact that it was classified as a Schedule 1 in the US, which is our equivalent Schedule 9 here is, ridiculous <laughs> but it is what it is it, I mean it happened for political reasons even in the face of science it was saying something completely different but um you know with good science and you know and and if we do this rigorously and we do this robustly because this is a very fragile re-entry back into medicine um we have to obviously take our time we have to do it right um yep. uh because we there is still that hangover effect of the, the 60s and the the um the, the, the political propaganda that was sort of you know thrown around at the time it's dangerous and that you know people jump out of windows and all of that kind of stuff so so we have to be very mindful of how we do this and do it well there's yep. a big responsibility that we bear i think in that yeah for sure and and hopefully we'll reach a point where um you know, before one becomes a politician you have to go through a ritualized um process of <laughs> Studying, working with the plant med plant spirit medicines. I'm I'm only half kidding. I, I actually I feel that it, it. it would be no, a great no, shift I, in I our political heard, landscape. I heard someone say that. <laughs> <laughs> I heard someone say that the other day. They said, "Oh, who was?" I can't remember. I was listening to a podcast. They said, "All oh, politicians should have ayahuasca." I went, "Oh gosh." <laughs> 
Can, can you imagine a, a G8 meeting and they have an ayahuasca <laughs> session or a psilocybin session or an MDMA oh session? God. It would be um, it would be <laughs> transformative for the world, that's for sure. I, well, I, I, I heard you speak about the integration piece post treatment, post therapy, post experience. Mm-hmm. So you're know, using art and so on and, and helping people anchor it in their mm-hmm. psychology and, and integrating. I'm curious as well how how much you're able with limited time and resources of course to prepare people for these experiences so i personally would encourage people to you know develop a, a meditative practice uh, to, to to do embodiment work yoga chugong and so on as a uh, psychological work and so on as a um, mm. as a as a build-up to these mm. experiences but that that often takes time energy resources inclination it might, might challenge people's belief mm. systems and so on so i wonder how what mm-hmm. what are you able to do within the, within a, a research protocol that uh, best prepares people for for the experiences mm-hmm. they have with the sort of slide yeah i i before i answer that i really just want to touch on what you just said because it's really important the because the research is now finding that the, if you do have, an, uh, I guess, a, a regular spiritual practice of some description, whether it be yoga or meditation, so you are more likely to actually hit those mystical type experiences within your psychedelic session. Um, so we know that that it, as a, I mean, it's not something that we we say you must do this, you know, prior to coming in. But if people do have a, a spiritual practice of some description, it does tend to. Um, uh, I guess increase the likelihood that they're going to have that that mystical type experience, spiritual type experience, within the, the psychedelic um, session. In terms of what we do within the research protocol, we obviously it's it's we have a short period of time. We have three sessions beforehand. Um, sometimes we can extend that if we feel that somebody needs a little bit more preparation, um, or if we just need some more time as therapists to just get a good sense of their landscape to make sure that they're safe enough to tolerate the treatment, we may need to have a little bit more time. But generally, it's three sessions in our particular protocol. I know that that's getting reduced in other studies, and um, I guess the reason for that is that they're looking for a way of being able to implement this in a way that's scalable and efficacious in a medical or clinical kind of a setting. But I think for us, we very much felt that three sessions was the minimum for us. Um, we obviously want to develop a rapport with that person because they're entering into a really vulnerable space. So, so it's as much um, just time spent with that person and with that person with us as therapists um, so that we can develop that rapport, get a really good sense of their life, give them a narrative of their life, a narrative of their illness, um, uh, get a sense of, of um, um, how they may meet psychedelic experiences and but by, by which I mean you know there's not sort of right or right, right or strong ways to sort of to, to do that but except to, you know would they be able to tolerate that or would it be a bit too much for the the character that they are in terms of you know if they've had history of you know quite complex trauma you know we we want to make sure that that person is you know safe enough and um to tolerate the treatment so we've got to get a good sense of them and how they may um uh manage some challenging experiences that may come up because it can be quite overwhelming at times as well but it, it, it can move and shift and change very quickly as well so i guess a part of it is getting a really good sense of, of who this person is and, and how they may navigate this and then it's actually giving them some preparatory work around how to navigate it when it does come up um so we talk about what psilocybin sessions can evoke or can you know, what people can experience in general not to say that it's going to happen to everyone because everyone's experience is different and even from dose one to dose two if they happen to get the active you know um, medicine and their their first dose and then the second dose which is the, the actual psilocybin so they can have very different experiences between one and two so getting um, people familiar with okay you may feel like you're dissolving or warping or melting or going crazy or dying that's okay, your lungs will still breathe, your heart will still beat, it's okay. Um, and actually, so that, so that it's almost like a, a bit of a, a, a cue marker, so that if they do experience that when they're in it, they go, oh, okay, that's right, Mars said that was normal, that's okay, that's part of it. So instead of going into a full-blown panic attack, they can kind of recognise the experience and, and just sort of move through it and navigate it a little easier. Um, and then um, 
taking into sort of, you know, the, the mantra of, of the Richard, trust, let go, be open, TLO, trust, let go, be open. Um, and just trusting the process of, of that it will, um, you know, you sort of have this sort of lead in, there's a peak experience, and then it just sort of pulls you out very gently and, um, and how to meet challenging experiences, if it be anxiety, if it be quite intense experiences of emotion and, and um, how to navigate that. And actually, it's really, this is where kind of, uh, if you do have a mindfulness practice, this is, can be very, very useful here because the, try to sort of coach people into this radical act of moving towards and into the thing that scares them or the thing that feels like I know I don't want to go there it's too icky or I don't like that feeling or what have you and we really try to orient them to move going to you know breathing into it and moving through it anyway um and and because what's on the other side of that can be quite surprising and mm. um, so I think it's really about helping people learn to tolerate feared emotional states um, that may arise and set, but also then just kind of getting curious and, and just enjoying the this very um, unusual um, opportunity mm. to, to just kind of go, wow, you know, what part of my psyche do you have from or what's this? Or, or if there's something that comes up, have a conversation with it, kind of interview it, you know, what are you here to tell me? Or, you know, that, that kind of... Um, just preparing them for the experience and, and being part of it, but at the same time not analysing it too much mm. either. So letting letting that part of you sort of drop away and just really being um, and experiencing the the the, the psilocybin to its fullest extent. Mm. So and then also we talk about intention setting. There's a big big focus on setting an intention at the same time not feeling like we've got to kind of make a, a, a make our experience happen according to that intention because I think the minute you should try and control it, you can be in all sorts of trouble. So at the same time, it's, it's this it's sort of a, a little paradoxical in that way, having an intention to remind you of why you're doing it in those challenging moments, but at the same time, not letting it sort of uh, drive you to try and control the experience in that way. Um, be the passenger. Um, so yeah, so we, we do a lot of that. We do a little bit of um, anxiety management. But yeah, we talk about music. We talk about music a lot. Um, because do people select session, people their own will... music or do you advise what music might be beneficial? Or... So we're, we're trying it a little bit different. We actually offer um, uh, three different playlists, which is the first that I know of. Um, the moment, I, I could be wrong though. I think that there may be other... Um, studies thinking to do this or, or perhaps as introduce this but what, what we have we've got our own um, set playlist that we cultivated and then or curated, curated I should say and then uh, we also use um, the one that was currently being used at John Hopkins and was created by Bill Richards and Brian Richards who are divine mentors of mine and I'm very very grateful for that experience uh, so Bill Richards was one of the original um, Maryland um, psychiatric therapist who was I think one of the last psychiatrists standing when it was all shut down and has now come back and was doing the work with John Hopkins and also continues to do it with his son Brian who's just equally gorgeous so they've got a playlist there that they use and then also um, one that was developed uh, with Imperial College um, for their depression study as well so we give people a little sampler of those because uh, they're actually sort of quite distinct um, each, each playlist Give people a little sample and go. What what sort of what vibes for you um, in terms of where you would sit? Are you sort of more classical? Are you a little bit more um, um, atmospheric and ambient? Or do you want a bit of um, ours is a little bit eclectic in that way? We have a little bit of kind of I guess modern classical, but we also have some ambient. We have some world music, a little bit tribal kind of stuff as well. Um, and then I get a bit of a sense of that. But we have a fourth one just in case, and it's just bird song. <laughs> it is just birds. The whole seven hours of just birds. Not um, cockatoos and kookaburras, and, I'm assuming. No. They're, <laughs> <laughs> they're an asset. No, it's like kookaburras would be like, God, get these on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are Australian birds. I think there's a, there's a really soft call of a kookaburra in the, in the distance in, in one of the, 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 the calls, but <clears throat> they're really just sort of Australian birds. I start from morning calls up into the evening and we start with, um, our, oh, we end with owls and it's like, mm. takes you from 
a, a day journey, if you like. So we have a way of giving people a degree of um, agency over their music experience because it's such a powerful part of people's experience, um, the, the soundscape. Mm. And, um, yeah, so that that was important for us that people would have a degree of choice there. Mm. Um, so if yeah, I, so if we, I wanted, if I wanted to listen to, to John Hopkins and, and Tom Day and so on, if I was on the trial, then I might, I might, I might get lucky with uh, the, the created list. <laughs> the, um, yeah, look, I mean, the, 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 the John Hopkins one has changed. Is, is actually, is actually a, a little a, bit over time. A, but, yeah. a musician called, uh, called John Hopkins. Um, oh, I know, yeah, yes. Right. He's actually on our playlist. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm not surprised. Cause, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you know, if you know uh, there's, uh, there's one John, uh, that John does, there's two actually that we have on there, Lena Moss and uh, Cold out there. Beautiful. So Yeah, I know them both. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. So we've, we've, um, yeah, we, we've placed a big emphasis on, on, on the music experience. I think just the whole space as well is very, very important. So we, we cultivate that space. It doesn't look like a hospital room at all. And I guess part of the preparation, as you were talking to you before, um, these things that we, that we all talk about, we also orient people to the room and to the space. So they, they have a feeling of, of, okay, this is where I'm going to be sitting. This is where these two are going to be sitting. And we're with them the entire time. Um, then we, we set it up on the day. There's sort of... It's, really quite lovely there's artwork there's a bit of um and fake candles because you can't use real candles in a hospital setting <laughs> um, but you know it's very ambient it's lowered light it's the music is beautiful we have a space for them to bring in meaningful objects um that so from home whether they be photos and um and jewelry or little artifacts that, that are, are important and meaningful for them so that they sort of own that space that, that we create with them um, and we basically then just, yeah, do a little, it's, it's several hours of it. So we have our little tea station and our snack station and we encourage them to bring their, their little snacks too. So it's quite a, quite an intense space, like, um, the therapy, you know, usually a therapist, you do one hour and it's goodbye. And this is several hours with two therapists and, um, it's quite, quite intimate in that way. So we, we, there's a, there's a lot of attention to, to, to preparing the person for their experiences, but also then orienting them to the space and to us as well, so that they can feel trusting of the process. And you mentioned at the start of our conversation that there's a, a, a further trial already being planned, that there's, 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 there's more activity in this area. Can you expand on that a little? There is. Um, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, <laughs> but I will say that um, there have been... I, I know that there are uh, several studies that have been given approval behind the scenes and are likely to be announced in the coming months. So That's watch exciting. this space. I'm very, very, very excited for, for some colleagues that are, that are uh, going to be joining us in this space. So that's wonderful. I'm really, very excited. That's great news. And it feels uh, appropriate for anyone that's, that's listening or watching maybe in Australia who, who uh, is wanting to potentially access the trial or have their family access the trial or, uh, or maybe we have some um, wealthy donors listening who want, want to support oh, financially. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> where, where, where would we direct yeah. these people? Where are they, where's the, where the inquiry? So, <laughs> the best and, – and, I, I look, the best way to contact would be via um, our email, which is psilocybin study at scha.org.au. So, psilocybin study, all one word. Um, and I guess I need to spell that because it's a tricky one to say. It's P S I L O C Y B I N. Um, so, psilocybin study, all one word at scha.org.au. So, That's please drop us a line. Um, unfortunately, SBHA. Yeah. St. Vincent's Hospital Australia, yeah. it stands for. Yeah. So, yeah. The, um, what we do get bombarded with inquiries. Um, so it means that, unfortunately, if there are um, individual inquiries, we do our best to get back to you, but it's, it is very difficult given the sheer number and the volume of, of, of inquiries and, and uh, contact that we have. So we will do our very best to get back to you. But, but all of them are read and, um, yeah, by, by the team. So, yeah. 
and if you do feel like yeah, if it, you have um, a, a terminal illness and you do want to, if you're considering participating in the study, please please reach out to us and we can do some good talking with you about some decision and also screening if, if you would be eligible as well. Wonderful. Well, like I, I really feel that sense of privilege that you speak of to be doing the work that you're doing. I'm so grateful that you exist and that uh, St. Vincent's is supporting this and that the wider public is getting behind this work. Um, and I'm really grateful that you've taken the time to, to chat with us today and, and, and share a little bit of what's happening. I look forward to keeping an eye on the studies to come and hope to have more conversations with you in the future to, to, to learn more of, of what the research is telling us. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I would be very keen to talk with you again. I, I have questions for you too. I want to ask about your experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, sh I, don't, I don't know. I think most, most of my listeners would, would know that I've, I've had brain cancer and that funnily enough, mm -hmm. I, I, I worked at uh, St. Vincent's Medical Research Institute as well. So when I found out about this study happening literally uh, on campus, uh, the first in Australia, I was super excited. And then in between our scheduling this session and uh, it, it happening, um, there's been a recurrence with my brain cancer. So the, the, the dark humor in me is finding it very funny that there's this sort of um, uh, appropriateness and personal relevance along with a uh, sort of professional mm. interest in the, the work that you're doing. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah I, I've personally been so touched and, um, served by psilocybin um, and, and caring uh, psychotherapeutic professionals such as yourself um, that to, to, to know this is now really beginning to expand and, and, and be tested and, and, mm. and improved and refined as a process is um, yeah, very, very exciting. So uh, to, to an enjoyable conversation today and thank, thank you for giving us your time, Margo. I'm really grateful. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for being so generous with your own experiences too. Uh, my, my, my pleasure. And thank you to everyone watching today. Uh, we appreciate your support. Um, you can visit loveandtruthparty.org to join the community, download or order love letters if you want to play at being a new earth ninja, uh, register for our newsletter, and of course connect on social media or consider a financial gift at loveandtruthparty.org. Thank you to all our existing supporters and contributors. Together we are creating kind, conscious, courageous human community. Mm -hmm.